Anguttara Nikaya, The Numerical Discourses, Dasakanipata, Book of the Tens, Suttas 91 to 100, Upali Vagga, The Section on the Venerable Upali, Kama Bhogi Sutta, Seeking After Sensual Enjoyments. At one time, the Blessed One was living in the monastery offered by Anatapindika at Jeda's Park in Savati. There, the householder Anatapindika came and approached the Blessed One, and after having paid homage to him, sat on the side. The Blessed One then said to the householder Anatapindika, Householder, in existence there are these ten types of beings to be found, who long for and seek after sensual enjoyments. Now who are these ten? Here, householder, someone longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments while making his money through immoral and unethical means, carelessly and violently doing whatever he deems necessary. Then, once having amassed his wealth, he neither experiences happiness nor does he engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. Next, householder, someone who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through immoral and unethical means, carelessly and violently doing whatever he deems necessary. Then, once having amassed his wealth, he experiences happiness and feels gratified, but he does not engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. Next, householder, someone who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through immoral and unethical means, carelessly and violently doing whatever he deems necessary. Then, once having amassed his wealth, he experiences happiness and feels gratified, and he also engages in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. Next, householder, someone who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through both moral and ethical means, as well as those that are immoral and unethical where he sometimes is careful and considerate, but at other times he carelessly and violently does whatever he deems necessary. Now, once having amassed his wealth, he neither experiences happiness, nor does he engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. Next householder, someone who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through both moral and unethical means, as well as those that are immoral and unethical, where he sometimes is careful and considerate, but at other times he carelessly and violently does whatever he deems necessary. Then, once having amassed his wealth, he experiences happiness and feels gratified, but he does not engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. Next, householder, someone who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through both moral and ethical means, as well as those that are immoral and unethical, where he sometimes is careful and considerate, but at other times he carelessly and violently does whatever he deems necessary. Then, once having amassed his wealth, he experiences happiness and feels gratified, and he also engages in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. Next, householder, someone who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments while making his money through only moral and ethical means, where he is carefully considerate of others, always reflecting on his financial goals, actions, and their impact on others. Thus, abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm unto others. Now, once having amassed his wealth, he neither experiences happiness nor does he engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. 
Next householder, someone who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through only moral and ethical means, where he is carefully considerate of others, always reflecting on his financial goals, actions, and their impact on others, thus abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm on to others. Then, once having amassed his wealth, he experiences happiness and feels gratified, but he does not engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. Next householder, someone who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through only moral and ethical means, where he is carefully considerate of others always reflecting on his financial goals, actions, and their impact on others, thus abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm on to others. Then, once having amassed his wealth, he experiences happiness and feels gratified, and he engages in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. However, while using his wealth, this person still remains strongly and deeply attached to it, obsessed with it, as he secretly continues to grab and hold on to his wealth, not realizing the perils and danger of being caught in this obsessive and deep drive of his. And as a result, he neither identifies nor seeks out the very escape and release from it. And, householder, there is another person who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments while making his money through only moral and ethical means, where he is carefully considerate of others, always reflecting on his financial goals, actions, and their impact on others, and thus abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm on to others. Then, once having amassed his wealth, he experiences happiness and feels gratified, and he engages in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. Furthermore, while using his wealth, this person is neither attached to it nor obsessed with it, because he no longer continues to grab or hold on to it, for he has realized the perils and danger of being caught in wanting to hold on to the wealth and as a result, he identifies and thus seeks out the very escape and release from it. Now, householder, in reference to the one who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments while making his money through immoral and unethical means, carelessly and violently doing whatever he deems necessary, and who, once having amassed his wealth, he neither experiences happiness nor does he engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. This person is to be blamed for three reasons. That he earns his livelihood through immoral and unethical means, through self-serving and inconsiderate means. The second reason for his blameworthy behavior is that he still does not find happiness for himself. And thirdly, it is because he does not engage in merit-making deeds through sharing the wealth and resources he now has come to possess. Thus, such a person who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments is to be blamed for these three reasons. Next householder, in reference to the one who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments while making his money through immoral and unethical means, carelessly and violently doing whatever he deems necessary, and who, once having amassed his wealth, experiences happiness and feels gratified, but does not engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. This person is to be blamed for two reasons and applauded for one. He is to be blamed for the fact that he earns his livelihood through immoral and unethical means, through self-serving and inconsiderate methods. The second reason for his blameworthy behavior 
is that he does not engage in merit-making deeds through sharing the wealth and resources he now has come to possess. But he is to be applauded for the fact that he does find happiness for himself. Thus, such a person who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments is to be blamed for two reasons and applauded for one. Next, householder, in reference to the one who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments while making his money through immoral and unethical means, carelessly and violently doing whatever he deems necessary, and who, once having amassed his wealth, experiences happiness and feels gratified, and he engages in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses, this person is to be blamed for one reason, but applauded for two. He is to be blamed for the fact that he earns his livelihood through immoral and unethical means, through self-serving and inconsiderate methods. But the first reason for him to be applauded is the fact that he finds happiness within himself. And the second reason is his engagement in merit-making deeds through sharing the wealth and resources he now has come to possess. Thus, such a person who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments is to be blamed for one reason, but applauded for two. Next, householder, in reference to the one who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through both moral and ethical means, as well as those that are immoral and unethical, where he sometimes is careful and considerate, but at other times he carelessly and violently does whatever he deems necessary, and who, once having amassed his wealth, neither experiences happiness nor does he engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. This person is to be applauded for one reason, but blamed for three. He is to be applauded for the fact that, at times, he earns his livelihood through moral and ethical means, while being careful and considerate. However, the first reason for him to be blamed is for the immoral and unethical means whereby he sometimes earns his livelihood, through self-serving and inconsiderate methods. His second reason to be blamed is the fact that he does not find happiness within himself, whereas the third reason is he does not engage in merit-making deeds due to his unwillingness to share the wealth and resources he now has come to possess. Thus, such a person who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments is to be applauded for one reason while being blamed for three. Next, householder, in reference to the one who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through both moral and ethical means, as well as those that are immoral and unethical, where he sometimes is careful and considerate, but at other times he carelessly and violently does whatever he deems necessary. And once having amassed his wealth, he experiences happiness and feels gratified, but he does not engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. This person is to be applauded for two reasons and blamed for two others. The first reason to applaud him is that he, at times, earns his livelihood through moral and ethical means, while being careful and considerate. The second reason to applaud him is because he finds happiness within himself, whereas the first reason to find him blameworthy is that he continues to still earn his living at times through immoral and unethical means, through self-serving and inconsiderate methods. And the second reason to blame him is because he does not engage in merit-making deeds, due to his unwillingness to share the wealth and resources he now has come to possess. Thus, such a person who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments is to be applauded for two reasons and blamed for two others. Next, householder, 
in reference to the one who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through both moral and ethical means, as well as those that are immoral and unethical, where he sometimes is careful and considerate, but at other times he carelessly and violently does whatever he deems necessary. In once having amassed his wealth, he experiences happiness and feels gratified, and he engages in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. This person is to be applauded for three reasons, while being found blameworthy for one. Thus, his first reason to be applauded is that, at times, he earns his livelihood through moral and ethical means, while being careful and considerate. His second reason to be celebrated is that he finds happiness within himself. And his third reason to be applauded is that he does engage in merit-making deeds due to his willingness to share the wealth and resources he now has come to possess. As for the reason for him to be blamed, that is due to his tendency to sometimes still continue to earn his livelihood through immoral and unethical methods, through self-serving and inconsiderate means. Thus, such a person who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments is to be applauded for three reasons and be blamed for one. Next householder, in reference to the one who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through only moral and ethical means, where he is carefully considerate of others, always reflecting on his financial goals, actions and their impact on others, thus abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm on to others. And once having amassed his wealth, he neither experiences happiness, nor does he engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. This person is to be applauded for one reason, while being found blameworthy for two others. Thus, he is celebrated for making his money through only moral and ethical means, where he is carefully considerate of others always reflecting on his financial goals, actions, and their impact on others, thus abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm on to others. However, his first reason to be blamed is for not finding happiness within himself. And the second reason for not engaging in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. Thus, such a person who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, is to be applauded for one reason, while being blamed for two others. Next householder, in reference to the one who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through only moral and ethical means, where he is carefully considerate of others, always reflecting on his financial goals, actions, and their impact on others, thus abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm on to others, and once having amassed his wealth, experiences happiness and feels gratified, but he does not engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. Now this person is to be applauded for two reasons, but blamed for one. Thus he is to be celebrated for making his money through only moral and ethical means where he is carefully considerate of others, always reflecting on his financial goals, actions, and their impact on others, thus abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm on to others. The second reason to applaud him is the fact that he finds happiness within himself. As for the reason to find him blameworthy, that is due to his unwillingness to engage in merit-making deeds, by sharing the resources he now possesses. Thus, such a person who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments is to be applauded for two reasons, while being blamed for only one. Next householder, in reference to the one who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments, while making his money through only moral and ethical means, 
where he is carefully considerate of others always reflecting on his financial goals actions and their impact on others abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm unto others and once having amassed his wealth he experiences happiness and feels gratified as well as engages in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses however while using his wealth this person still remains strongly and deeply attached to his wealth obsessed with it as he secretly continues to grab and hold on to it for he has not realized the perils and danger of being caught in this obsessive and deep drive of his and as a result he neither identifies nor seeks out the very escape and release from it now this person is to be applauded for three reasons but blamed for one thus he is to be celebrated for making his money through only moral and ethical means where he is carefully considerate of others always reflecting on his financial goals actions and their impact on others thus abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm unto others the second reason to applaud him is the fact that he finds happiness within himself his third reason to be celebrated is because he does engage in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses however his reason to be found blameworthy is due to the fact that he still remains strongly and deeply attached to his wealth obsessed with it as he secretly continues to grab and hold on to it for he has not realized the perils and danger of being caught in this obsessive and deep drive of his and as a result he neither identifies nor seeks out the very escape and release from it thus such a person who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments is to be applauded for three reasons but be blamed for only one as for the one householder who happens to be the person who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments while making his money through only moral and ethical means where he is carefully considerate of others always reflecting on his financial goals actions and their impact on others thus abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm on to others and once having amassed his wealth he experiences happiness and feels gratified and he engages in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses furthermore while using his wealth this person is neither attached to it nor obsessed with it because he no longer continues to grab or hold on to it for he has realized the perils and danger of being caught in wanting to hold on to the wealth and as a result he identifies and thus seeks out the very escape and release from it now such a person householder is to be applauded and celebrated for four reasons that is for making his money through only moral and ethical means where he is carefully considerate of others always reflecting on his financial goals actions and their impact on others thus abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm on to others the second reason is because once having amassed his wealth he experiences happiness and feels gratified and the third reason is because he engages in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses furthermore his fourth reason is due to the fact that this person is neither attached to his wealth nor obsessed by it because he no longer continues to grab or hold on to it for he has realized the perils and danger of being caught in wanting to hold on to the wealth and as a result he identifies and thus seeks out the very escape and release from it thus such a person who longs for and seeks after sensual enjoyments is to be applauded for four reasons so you see householder these are the ten types of beings to be found in existence 
who long for and seek after sensual enjoyments. The chief among these ten, who, being the finest and the highest, reigning supreme among all of them, is the one who, while longing for and seeking after sensual enjoyments, makes his money only through moral and ethical means, where he is carefully considerate of others, always reflecting on his financial goals, actions, and their impact on others, thus abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm unto others. And once having amassed his wealth, he experiences happiness and feels gratified as he engages in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. Furthermore, while using his wealth, this person is neither attached to it nor obsessed by it, because he no longer continues to grab or hold on to it, for he has realized the perils and danger of being caught in wanting to hold on to the wealth, and as a result, he identifies and thus seeks out the very escape and release from it. Imagine how, householder, milk comes from a cow, and from the milk one gets curd, and from the curd butter is produced, and from that butter ghee, and finally from that ghee out comes cream of ghee which is the undisputed and finest specimen, the very best among all the various transformations and stages of the milk itself. In the very same manner, householder, the chief among all these ten types of beings to be found in existence, who long for and seek after sensual enjoyments, the one considered their finest and highest, reigning supreme among all of them, is the one who, while longing for and seeking after sensual enjoyments, makes his money only through moral and ethical means, where he is carefully considerate of others, always reflecting on his financial goals, actions, and their impact on others. Thus, abstaining from any business endeavors where it may bring harm unto others, and once having amassed his wealth, he experiences happiness and feels gratified, and he also engages in merit-making deeds by sharing the resources he now possesses. Furthermore, householder, while using his wealth, this person is neither attached to it nor obsessed by it, because he no longer continues to grab or hold on to it, for he has realized the perils and danger of being caught in wanting to hold on to the wealth, and as a result, he identifies and thus seeks out the very escape and release from it. Bhaya Sutta Fears Once the householder Anatta Pindika approached the Blessed One, and after paying his respects, sat to one side, and the Blessed One spoke to him by saying, Householder, when the noble disciple has overcome five fear-causing dangers and threats, while also possessing the four factors of a stream winner, the one who has clearly and penetratingly seen with wisdom the noble pattern, whereby he then, if he so wishes, could declare, I am done with rebirth into the hell realms, the animal realm, the realm of hungry and dejected ghosts. I'm done with ever reappearing into states of misery and loss, and from any sort of birth in evil and horrible states. I am indeed a stream winner, therefore will never fall from that state, for I am on my unmistakable and direct course, headed on the straight path to Nibbana Supreme. And what, householder, are the five fears and threats they have overcome? Householder, 
whoever intentionally destroys kills or harms living beings whether directly or indirectly then because of that intentional action they create for themselves the situations where they will have to face the consequences in the form of fears and threats that will come to them sooner or later along with the mental emotional and physical suffering and pain they bring but when the person has abandoned the destruction and killing of living beings then they eliminate for themselves any situations where they would have to face fears and threats thus releasing themselves from the mental emotional and physical suffering and pain such evil and unwholesome actions would have brought thus the householder who refuses to harm or kill living beings protects those around him and himself too this in turn extinguishes any fears or threats connected to the destruction of life next householder whoever intentionally steals from another or takes what is not freely given whether directly or indirectly then because of that intentional action they create for themselves the situations where they will have to face consequences in the form of fears and threats that will come to them sooner or later along with the mental emotional and physical suffering and pain they bring but when the person has abandoned stealing or the taking of what is not freely given then they eliminate for themselves any situations where they would have to face fears and threats, thus releasing themselves from the mental, emotional and physical suffering and pain such evil and unwholesome actions would have brought. Thus, the householder who refuses to steal or take what is not given protects those around him and himself too this in turn extinguishes any fears or threats connected to stealing or the taking of what is not freely given next householder whoever intentionally engages in any kind of sexual misconduct whether directly or indirectly then because of that intentional action they create for themselves the situations where they will have to face consequences in the form of fears and threats that will come to them sooner or later along with the mental emotional and physical suffering and pain they bring but when the person has abandoned engaging in sexual misconduct then they eliminate for themselves any situations where they would have to face fears and threats thus releasing themselves from the mental emotional and physical suffering and pain such evil and unwholesome actions would have brought thus the householder who refuses to engage in sexual misconduct protects those around him and himself too this in turn extinguishes any fears or threats connected to engaging in sexual misconduct householder whoever intentionally lies or speaks falsely or engages in dishonest behavior whether directly or indirectly then because of that intentional action they create for themselves the situations where they will have to face consequences in the form of fears and threats that will come to them sooner or later along with the mental emotional and physical suffering and pain they bring but when the person has abandoned lies or speaking falsely or engaging in dishonest behavior then they eliminate for themselves any situations where they would have to face fears and threats thus releasing themselves from the mental emotional and physical suffering and pain such evil and unwholesome actions would have brought thus the householder who refuses to lie or speak falsely or engage in dishonest behavior protects those around him and himself too this in turn extinguishes any fears or threats connected to speaking falsely 
or engaging in dishonest behavior. Next householder, whoever intentionally, whether directly or indirectly, consumes any intoxicating substances, be it wine or liquor, or any kind of substances that delude and hallucinate the mind, resulting in heedlessness, then because of that intentional action, they create for themselves the situations where they will have to face consequences in the form of fears and threats that will come to them sooner or later, along with the mental, emotional, and physical suffering and pain they bring. But when the person has abandoned the taking of any intoxicating substances, be it wine or liquor, or any kind of substances that delude and hallucinate the mind, resulting in heedlessness, then they eliminate for themselves any situations where they would have to face fears and threats, thus releasing themselves from the mental, emotional, and physical suffering and pain such evil and unwholesome actions would have brought. Thus, the householder who refuses to consume any intoxicating substances, be it wine or liquor, or any kind of substances that delude and hallucinate the mind, resulting in heedlessness, protects those around him and himself too. This in turn extinguishes any fears or threats connected to the consumption of intoxicating and mind-altering substances. And what, householder, are the four factors of a stream winner that such a noble disciple possesses? Here, householder, the noble disciple possesses unshakable faith in his heart towards the Blessed One, knowing for certain how the Blessed One is the Arahant, perfectly awakened. He is supremely endowed with knowledge and conduct, the well-gone, the knower of the worlds, the incomparable tamer of those to be tamed, the teacher of gods and humans, the enlightened and blessed. Again, householder, the noble disciple possesses unshakable faith in his heart towards the Dhamma, knowing for certain how the Dhamma of the Blessed One is well expounded, realizable here and now. It is timeless, for it invites examination. It unmistakably leads inwards and onwards. It is to be realized by the wise for themselves. Again, householder, the noble disciple possesses unshakable faith in his heart towards the Sangha of noble disciples, knowing for certain how the Sangha of the Blessed One's noble disciple have come to the good path, the straight path, the wise path, the path of mutual appreciation and understanding. They are the four pairs that comprise the eight great beings who are the true venerable ones, worthy of offerings and of hospitality, the ones to be revered with clasped hands at the heart, the incomparable field of merit for the entire world. Again, householder, the noble disciple lives with virtue, thus possessing the virtuous heart that is so loved by the noble ones, for it is unbroken, flawless, spotless, impeccable, praised and recognized by the wise as leading to freedom, untouched by any kinds of corruptions, and thus he finds his heart softly and naturally gliding and landing into samadhi with ease. These, therefore, are the four factors that such a noble disciple possesses, householder. In this manner, householder, when the noble disciple has overcome five fear-causing dangers and threats, while also possessing the four factors of a stream winner, then, if he wishes to, he could declare, I am done with rebirth into the hell realms, the animal realm, the realm of hungry and dejected ghosts. I am done with ever reappearing into states of misery and loss, and from any sort of birth in evil and horrible states. 
I am indeed a stream winner, therefore will never fall from that state, for I am on my unmistakable and direct course, headed on the straight path to Nibbana Supreme. And what is the noble pattern, the correct measure that is to be seen and thoroughly penetrated with wisdom? Here, householder, the noble disciple spends his time reflecting on his experiences as he contemplates. When this is present, then this comes to be. When this arises, this also arises as a consequence. But when this is not present, this too does not come to be. And when this comes to an end and ceases to be, this also comes to an end and ceases. Thus, he comes to understand. In the presence of ignorance as their condition, habitual drives arise. In the presence of habitual drives as its condition, sense awareness arises. In the presence of sense awareness or consciousness as their condition, mentality and materiality arise. In the presence of mentality and materiality as their condition, the six sense spheres arise. In the presence of the six sense spheres as its condition, contact arises. In the presence of contact as its condition, feeling arises. In the presence of feeling as its condition, craving arises. In the presence of craving as its condition, grabbing arises. In the presence of grabbing as its condition, becoming arises. In the presence of becoming as its condition, rebirth arises. And in the presence of rebirth as their condition, aging and death, grieving, wailing, distress, torment, depression, and anguish arise. Thus, this whole accumulation of suffering arises. But, with the remainderless fading away and ending of ignorance, comes the ending of the habitual drives, the sankharas. With the ending of the habitual drives comes the ending of sense awareness or consciousness. With the ending of sense awareness comes the ending of mentality and materiality. With the ending of mentality and materiality comes the ending of the six sense spheres. With the ending of the six sense spheres comes the ending of contact. With the ending of contact comes the ending of feeling. With the ending of feeling comes the ending of craving. With the ending of craving comes the ending of grabbing. With the ending of grabbing comes the ending of becoming. With the ending of becoming comes the ending of rebirth. With the ending of rebirth comes the ending of aging and death, grieving, wailing, distress, torment, depression, and anguish. In this manner, this whole accumulation of suffering comes to an end and ceases. This is the noble pattern, householder, the correct measure that is to be seen and thoroughly penetrated with wisdom. Therefore, householder, when the noble disciple has overcome the five fear-causing dangers and threats, while also possessing the four factors of a stream winner, the one who has clearly and penetratingly seen with wisdom the noble pattern, whereby he then, if he so wishes, could declare, I am done with rebirth into the hell realms, the animal realm, the realm of hungry and dejected ghosts. I'm done with ever reappearing into states of misery and loss, and from any sort of birth in evil and horrible states. I am indeed a stream winner, therefore will never fall from that state. For I am on my unmistakable and direct course, headed on the straight path 
the Nibbana Supreme. King Ditika Sutta, what is your view? Once, while the Blessed One was living in the monastery offered by Anatta Pindika at Jeta's Park in Savati, there the householder Anatta Pindika decided to pay him a visit after mealtime. However, realizing that the Blessed One must be in seclusion, he reflected. Now it's not an appropriate time to go and see the Blessed One, for he must be in seclusion, meditating in his chambers. Nor would it be appropriate for me to go and see the other senior bhikkhus at the monastery, for they are also in seclusion. What if, instead, I go to the monastery of the wandering ascetics of other sects? They are rarely in seclusion. So he did go and approach the monastery of the wandering ascetics of other sects. Now at that time, the wandering ascetics of other sects were assembled together, making a raucous as they sat there, loudly talking on frivolous and unsuitable subject matters. Then, on seeing the householder Anatta Pindika approach their monastery from a distance, they quickly stopped talking so loudly while gesturing to each other to be silent, by saying, Good sirs, let's be quiet. Stop making such noise. The householder Anatta Pindika is coming this way, to our monastery. He is a disciple of the recluse Gautama, who is well known as one of the dedicated students of his, who wears white clothes and is a notable citizen living in Savati. Also, he is known as someone who likes silence and quietude. So if we too become quiet here, perhaps he would like to come and pay us a visit. Thus, those wandering ascetics of other sects lowered their voices as they silenced each other, and the householder Anatapindika came and approached those wandering ascetics of other sects at their monastery. And having exchanged friendly greetings with them, he sat to one side. Then, those wandering ascetics of other sects addressed the householder Anatapindika by asking him, Householder, tell us what is the view of the recluse Gotama? Sirs, I do not know all that is to be known about the Blessed One's view. Well then, householder, since you do not know the view of the recluse Gotama, tell us about the view of the bhikkhus. Sirs, I cannot say that I do know all that is to be known about the view of the bhikkhus either. In that case, householder, since you do not know the view of the recluse Gotama, nor about the view of his bhikkhus, then tell us what happens to be your view. Sirs, declaring to you as to what my view is, well, that won't be difficult for me to do at all. It would be much better, however, if you, venerable ones, first declare to me your own views, and immediately after that it will be quite easy for me to declare to you my own view. Once the householder Anantapindika finished saying these words, suddenly, one of those wandering ascetics exclaimed, Householder, existence is eternal. This is the truth. Thus, all other views are absolutely wrong. I am of this view. Then, another wandering ascetic exclaimed, Householder, existence is not eternal. This is the truth. And all other views are absolutely wrong. This is my view. Yet another wandering ascetic jumped in and said, Householder, existence is in fact limited. This is the truth. And all others are absolutely wrong. I am of this view. Then another wandering ascetic exclaimed, Householder, no. 
Existence is limitlessly boundless. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. This is my view. Then, another wandering ascetic stated, Householder, the soul and the body are one and the same. This is the truth. While all others are absolutely wrong, this is the view I hold. Then, another wandering ascetic stated, Householder, no, no, no. The soul is separate and different from the physical body. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. This is the view that I hold. Yet another wandering ascetic came forward by saying, Householder, the Tathagata lives on after death. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. This happens to be my view. Still another wandering ascetic exclaimed by saying, No, householder, once dead, the Tathagata does not live after death. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. And this happens to be my view. Then another wandering ascetic said, Householder, the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after his death. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. This is my view. And then another wandering ascetic exclaimed, Householder, no, the Tathagata neither exists nor does he not exist after his death. This is the truth. All others are absolutely wrong. This happens to be my view. Then, having heard what was said, the householder Anatapindika addressed those wandering ascetics by saying, Sirs, whichever venerable one claimed the view, existence is eternal, this is the truth. Thus, all other views are absolutely wrong. I am of this view. I know that this Venerable One's view has in fact arisen, either as the result of his unwise and careless attention, or on account of hearing it from someone else, and subscribing to it without proper consideration. This because... Such a view is prepared, fabricated, and conditioned, for it is the product of mental activity, and therefore is dependently arisen. Now anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. Furthermore, whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Now whenever and whatever that venerable sir reaches out for or attaches himself to, that will result in none other than suffering itself. Next, whichever venerable one claimed the view, existence is not eternal. This is the truth, and all other views are absolutely wrong. This is my view. I know that this Venerable One's view has in fact arisen, either as the result of his unwise and careless attention, or on account of hearing it from someone else, and subscribing to it without proper consideration. This because such a view is prepared, fabricated, and conditioned, for it is the product of mental activity and therefore is dependently arisen. Now anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. Furthermore, whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Now whenever and whatever that venerable sir reaches out for or attaches himself to, that will result in none other than suffering itself. Next, whichever venerable one claimed the view, existence is in fact limited. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. I am of this view. 
I know that this Venerable One's view has in fact arisen, either as the result of his unwise and careless attention, or on account of hearing it from someone else, and subscribing to it without proper consideration. This because such a view is prepared, fabricated, and conditioned, for it is the product of mental activity, and therefore is dependently arisen. Now anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. Furthermore, whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Now whenever and whatever that venerable sir reaches out for or attaches himself to, that will result in none other than suffering itself. Next, whichever venerable one claimed the view, existence is limitlessly boundless. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. This is my view. I know that this venerable one's view also has in fact arisen, either as the result of his unwise and careless attention, or on account of hearing it from someone else, and subscribing to it without proper consideration. This because such a view is prepared, fabricated, and conditioned, for it is the product of mental activity, and therefore is dependently arisen. Now anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. Furthermore, whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Now whenever or whatever that venerable sir reaches out for or attaches himself to, that will result in none other than suffering itself. Next, whichever venerable one claimed the view, the soul and the body are one and the same. This is the truth, while all others are absolutely wrong. This is the view I hold. I know that this venerable one's view has in fact arisen, either as the result of his unwise and careless attention, or on account of hearing it from someone else, and subscribing to it without proper consideration. This because such a view is prepared, fabricated, and conditioned, for it is the product of mental activity, and therefore is dependently arisen. Now anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. Furthermore, whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Now whenever and whatever that venerable sir reaches out for or attaches himself to, that will result in none other than suffering itself. Next, whichever venerable one claimed the view, the soul is separate and different from the physical body. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. This is the view I hold. I know that this venerable one's view also has in fact arisen either as the result of his unwise and careless attention, or on account of hearing it from someone else, and subscribing to it without proper consideration. This because such a view is prepared, fabricated, and conditioned, for it is the product of mental activity, and therefore is dependently arisen. Now anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. Furthermore, whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Now whenever and whatever that venerable sir reaches out for or attaches himself to, that will result in none other than suffering itself. Next, whichever venerable one claimed the view, the Tathagata lives on after death. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. This happens to be my view. I know that this venerable one's view has in fact arisen, either as the result of his unwise and careless attention, or on account of hearing it from someone else, and subscribing to it without proper consideration. This because such a view is prepared, fabricated, and conditioned for it is the product of mental activity, and therefore is dependently arisen. Now anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. 
Furthermore, whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Now whenever and whatever that venerable sir reaches out for or attaches himself to, that will result in none other than suffering itself. Next, whichever venerable one claimed the view, once dead, the Tathagata does not live after death, this is the truth and all others are absolutely wrong, and this happens to be my view, I know that this venerable one's view has in fact arisen either as the result of his unwise and careless attention, or on account of hearing it from someone else, and subscribing to it without proper consideration. This because such a view is prepared, fabricated, and conditioned, for it is the product of mental activity, and therefore is dependently arisen. Now anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. Furthermore, whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Now whenever and whatever that venerable sir reaches out for or attaches himself to, that will result in none other than suffering itself. Next, whichever venerable one claimed the view, the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after his death. This is the truth and all others are absolutely wrong. This is my view. I know that this venerable one's view has in fact arisen either as the result of his unwise and careless attention or on account of hearing it from someone else and subscribing to it without proper consideration. This because such a view is prepared, fabricated and conditioned, for it is the product of mental activity and therefore is dependently arisen. Now anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. Furthermore, whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Now whenever and whatever that venerable sir reaches out for or attaches himself to, that will result in none other than suffering itself. Next, whichever venerable one claimed the view, the Tathagata neither exists nor does he not exist after his death. This is the truth. All others are absolutely wrong. This happens to be my view. I know that this venerable one's view also has in fact arisen either as the result of his unwise and careless attention or on account of hearing it from someone else and subscribing to it without proper consideration. This because such a view is prepared, fabricated, and conditioned, for it is the product of mental activity, and therefore is dependently arisen. Now anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. Furthermore, whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Now whenever and whatever that venerable sir reaches out for or attaches himself to, that will result in none other than suffering itself. Once this was said, those wandering ascetics of other sects retorted, Well, householder, we have each here stated our individual views to you. Now tell us what yours is. And the householder Anata Pindika said, Venerable sirs, Whatever has arisen and come into being is in fact prepared, fabricated, and conditioned. For it is the product of mental activity, and therefore dependently arisen. And anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. Furthermore, whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Now, I have personally seen unmistakably and directly and with wisdom that whatever suffering all this conditionality may produce is in fact not mine, does not belong to me, for it is not part of myself, nor am I a part of it. Now this is my view. Then, one of the wandering ascetics said, So, householder, 
whatever has arisen and come into being is in fact prepared, fabricated and conditioned, because it is the product of mental activity and therefore dependently arisen. And anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. And whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Further, whenever and whatever that one reaches out for or attaches himself to, that results in none other than suffering itself? Indeed, sirs. Whatever has arisen and come into being is in fact prepared, fabricated and conditioned, for it is the product of mental activity and therefore dependently arisen. And anything that is dependently arisen is itself impermanent. Furthermore, whatever is thus impermanent happens to be suffering itself. Now, I have personally seen, unmistakably and directly, and with wisdom, that whatever suffering all this conditionality may produce is in fact not mine, does not belong to me, for it is not part of myself, nor am I a part of it. This is my view. For by having seen how things come to be, I now understand that there is in fact a way to step out and completely escape from all that mass of suffering. Now, once this was said by the householder Anathapindika, Every one of those wandering ascetics became quiet, having lost their words, sitting in silence, amazed, perplexed, defeated, and unable to speak. Then, on seeing that those wandering ascetics of other sects had become quiet, having lost their words, sitting in silence, amazed, perplexed, defeated, and unable to speak, the householder Anathapindika arose from his seat and went to the Blessed One. Once there, the householder Anathapindika approached the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat to one side and reported what had taken place earlier, and the exchange of dialogue between himself and the wandering ascetics of other sects during his visit at their monastery. And the Blessed One said, Sadhu, sadhu, householder. For truly, that is how one must refute the ignorance of such empty and foolish men, by engaging with them through the proper use of reason, in order to reprove the nonsense they preach. Then the Blessed One instructed, encouraged, inspired, and gladdened the householder Anathapindika's heart even further with a talk on the Dhamma, following which the householder Anathapindika, while paying homage to the Blessed One, arose from his seat and, after circumambulating the Blessed One, left. Then the Blessed One, by addressing the gathered bhikkhus, he said, Bhikkhus, even if a bhikkhu who had been ordained in this dispensation for over a hundred years were to face and refute the ignorance of such empty and foolish ascetics of other sects, while engaging with them through the proper use of reason in reproving the nonsense they preach, such a bhikkhu would do so exactly as the householder Anathapindika did today. Vajjiya Mahita Sutta With Vajjiya Mahita, the householder At one time, the Blessed One was living in Champa, on the bank of the Gangara lotus pond. It was then that the householder, Vajjiya Mahita, having decided to go and pay his respects to the Blessed One, began walking around midday from Champa, towards the Gaggara lotus pond. But then it occurred to the householder Vajjiya Mahita, actually, now would not be an appropriate time to go and see the Blessed One, for he must be in seclusion, meditating in his chambers. 
nor would it be appropriate for me to go and see the other senior bhikkhus at the monastery, for they too are in seclusion. What if instead I go to the monastery of the wandering ascetics of other sects? They are rarely in seclusion. So he did go and approach the monastery of the wandering ascetics of other sects. Now at that time the wandering ascetics of other sects were assembled together, making a raucous, as they sat there loudly talking on frivolous and unsuitable subject matters. Then, on seeing the householder, Vajjiya Mahita, approach their monastery from a distance, they quickly stopped talking so loudly, while gesturing at each other to be silent, by saying, Good sirs, let's be quiet. Stop making much noise. The householder, Vajjiya Mahita, is coming this way, to our monastery. He is a disciple of the recluse Gotama who is well known as one of the dedicated students of his, who wears white clothes, and is a notable citizen living in Champa. Also, he is known as someone who likes silence and quietude. So if we, too, become quiet here, perhaps he would like to come and pay us a visit. Thus, those wandering ascetics of other sects lowered their voices as they silenced each other, and the householder, Vajjiya Mahita, came and approached those wandering ascetics of other sects at their monastery. And having exchanged friendly greetings with them, he sat to one side. Then those wandering ascetics of other sects addressed the householder, Vajjiya Mahita, by asking him, Householder, is it true what they say? that the recluse Gotama finds the practice of all kinds of austerities to be blameworthy, and thereby he scolds and shuns them reprovingly, while declaring all those who practice the hard-to-bear rough life of austerities as reproachable? No, venerable sirs, that is not true. The Blessed One does not find the practice of all kinds of austerities to be blameworthy. He neither categorically scolds or shuns them reprovingly, nor declares all those who practice the hard-to-bear, rough life of austerities as reproachable. However, sirs, the Blessed One does find things that truly deserve to be blamed as those that are blameworthy. Similarly, he finds those things that deserve to be praised and celebrated as truly praiseworthy and to be celebrated. Therefore, venerable sirs, the Blessed One does not make such categorical generalizations as you present it. Instead, he carefully analyzes and considers all aspects of the matter at hand first, and only then does he speak on the issue and make a statement accordingly. When this was said, one of those wandering ascetics exclaimed by saying to the householder, Vajjiya Mahita, Come on, householder, the way you are praising the recluse Gotama, he is a negating objector, who never gives a straight answer, nor does he make any definitive declarations. Venerable sir, let me respond by telling you how the Blessed One definitively declares. This is skillful to engage in, whereas to engage in that is in fact unskillful. Thus, you see, the Blessed One clearly points out the truth about things by delineating and showing the clear distinctions between all that is skillful and unskillful. Therefore, it is absolutely incorrect to claim that the Blessed One is a negating objector who never gives a straight answer. Now, once this was said by the householder Vajjiya Mahita, every one of those wandering ascetics became quiet, having lost their words, sitting in silence, amazed, perplexed, defeated, and unable to speak. 
Then, on seeing that those wandering ascetics of other sects had become quiet, having lost their words, sitting in silence, amazed, perplexed, defeated, and unable to speak, the householder, Vajya Mahita, arose from his seat and went to see the Blessed One. Once there, the householder, Vajya Mahita, approached the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat to one side and reported what had taken place earlier, and the exchange of dialogue between himself and the wandering ascetics of other sects during his visit at their monastery. And the Blessed One said, Sadhu, Sadhu, householder, for truly that is how one must refute the ignorance of such empty and foolish men, by engaging with them through the proper use of reason, in order to reprove the nonsense they preach. For I do not declare, householder, that the practice of all kinds of austerities are to be considered as blameworthy, nor do I declare that all kinds of austerities are helpful or are to be observed and practiced either. Similarly, householder, I do not declare that all observances should be undertaken, nor do I declare that all observances should not be undertaken either. Also, householder, I do not declare that one should strive by exerting oneself in all forms of practice. However, I do not declare that one should stop striving or exerting oneself in a steady practice. Further, householder, I do not declare that one should give up and relinquish everything. But I also do not declare that one should not give up or relinquish things. Also, householder, I do not declare that one should attain release by pursuing all aspects and methods of release in order to liberate oneself. And, householder, I do not declare that one should not attain release by pursuing a path and method of release in order to liberate oneself. This because, householder, while engaging in a certain type of austerity practice, if unskillful and evil states of mind appear and start increasing in oneself, meanwhile skillful and wholesome states of mind decrease, then I declare such austerity practices to be blameworthy indeed. Hence, one must immediately stop engaging in such practices altogether. However, householder, if while engaging in a certain type of austerity practice, Unskillful and evil states of mind start decreasing and begin to disappear from oneself, while skillful and wholesome states of mind increase and grow. Then I declare such austerity practices to be praiseworthy and encouraged, in fact. Hence, one must continue engaging in them. Further, householder, while undertaking a certain type of observance, if unskillful and evil states of mind appear and start increasing in oneself, meanwhile skillful and wholesome states of mind decrease, then I declare the undertaking of such observances to be blameworthy indeed. Hence, one must immediately stop engaging in such practices altogether. But, householder, while undertaking a certain type of observance, if unskillful and evil states of mind start decreasing and begin to disappear from oneself, while skillful and wholesome states of mind increase and grow, then I declare the undertaking of such observances to be praiseworthy and in fact encouraged. Hence, one must continue engaging in them. Also, householder, while striving by exerting oneself in a certain form of practice, if unskillful and evil states of mind appear and start increasing in oneself, meanwhile skillful and wholesome states of mind decrease, then I declare the form of practice one is striving and exerting oneself in to be blameworthy indeed. Hence, one must immediately stop striving 
and exerting oneself in that form of practice altogether. But, householder, while striving by exerting oneself in a certain form of practice, if unskillful and evil states of mind start decreasing and begin to disappear from oneself, while skillful and wholesome states of mind increase and grow, then I declare the form of practice one is striving and exerting oneself in to be praiseworthy and encouraged. Hence, one must continue striving and exerting oneself in that form of practice. Also, householder, while someone works towards giving up or relinquishing something, if unskillful and evil states of mind appear and start increasing in oneself, meanwhile skillful and wholesome states of mind decrease, then I declare that sort of giving up or relinquishing is in fact blameworthy indeed. Hence, one must immediately stop giving up or relinquishing it. However, householder, while someone works towards giving up or relinquishing something, if unskillful and evil states of mind start decreasing and begin to disappear from oneself, while skillful and wholesome states of mind increase and grow, then I declare that sort of giving up or relinquishing to be in fact praiseworthy and encouraged. Hence, one must continue giving it up and relinquishing it further. And when, householder, while someone works towards attaining release by pursuing a certain method of release, if unskillful and evil states of mind appear and start increasing in oneself, meanwhile skillful and wholesome states of mind decrease, then I declare that sort of pursuit of attaining release to be in fact blameworthy indeed. Hence, one must immediately steer clear by avoiding that method of practice to attain release altogether. But, householder, while someone works towards attaining release by pursuing a certain method of release, if unskillful and evil states of mind start decreasing and begin to disappear from oneself, while skillful and wholesome states of mind increase and grow, then I declare that sort of pursuit of attaining release to be in fact praiseworthy and encouraged. Hence, one must continue persevering and giving it one's all to that method of practice in order to attain release. Then, the Blessed One instructed, encouraged, inspired, and gladdened the householder Vajjaya Mahita's heart even further with a talk on the Dhamma, following which the householder Vajjaya Mahita, while paying homage to the Blessed One, arose from his seat, and after circumambulating the Blessed One, left. Then the Blessed One addressed the gathered bhikkhus there, as he said, Bhikkhus, even if a bhikkhu in this dispensation who having lived with but a tiny bit of dust still remaining in his eyes, were to face and refute the ignorance of such empty and foolish ascetics of other sects, while engaging with them through the proper use of reason, in reproving the nonsense they preach, such a bhikkhu would do just exactly as the householder Vajjiyamahita did today. Uttiya Sutta, the wandering ascetic Uttiya. Once the wandering ascetic Uttiya came and approached the Blessed One, and after exchanging friendly greetings, sat down to one side and said, Does the good Sir Gautama declare, Existence is eternal, this is the truth, thus all other views are absolutely wrong? And the Blessed One replied, No, Uttiya, I have not declared. Existence is eternal. This is the truth. Thus, all other views are absolutely wrong. Then, does the good Sir Gautama declare, Existence is not eternal. This is the truth. Thus, all other views are absolutely wrong. 
The Blessed One replied, Also, Uttiya, I have not declared. Existence is not eternal. This is the truth. Thus all other views are absolutely wrong. Then does the good Sir Gautama declare, Existence is in fact limited and not boundless. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong? And the Blessed One replied, Again, Uttiya, I do not declare existence is in fact limited and not boundless. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. Then does the good Sir Gautama declare existence is boundlessly eternal? This is the truth, thus all other views are absolutely wrong? The Blessed One replied, Again, Uttiya, I do not declare. Existence is boundlessly eternal. This is the truth. Thus, all other views are absolutely wrong. Then does the good Sir Gautama declare, The soul and the body are one and the same. This is the truth, while all others are absolutely wrong? And the Blessed One replied, Again, Uttiya, I do not declare the soul and the body are one and the same. This is the truth, while all others are absolutely wrong. Then does the good Sir Gautama declare the soul is separate and thus different from the physical body? This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong? The Blessed One replied, Again, Uttiya, I do not declare the soul is separate and thus different from the physical body. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. Then does the good Sir Gautama declare, The Tathagata lives on after death. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. The Blessed One replied, Again, Uttiya, I do not declare the Tathagata lives on after death. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. Then does the good Sir Gautama declare, Once dead, the Tathagata does not live after death. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. And the Blessed One replied, Again, Nutia, I do not declare, Once dead, the Tathagata does not live after death. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. Then does the good Sir Gautama declare the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after his death? This is the truth. All others are absolutely wrong. And the Blessed One again replied, Again, Uttiya, I do not declare the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after his death. This is the truth. All others are absolutely wrong. Then does the good Sir Gautama declare the Tathagata neither exists nor does he not exist after his death? This is the truth. All others are absolutely wrong. And the Blessed One replied, Again, Uttiya, I do not declare the Tathagata neither exists nor does he not exist after his death. This is the truth. All others are absolutely wrong. Then Uttiya, the wandering ascetic, remarked by asking, Good Sir Gautama, when asked whether you declare existence is eternal, this is the truth, thus all other views are absolutely wrong, you responded by saying, You do not declare such a thing. Similarly, when asked, Does the good Sir Gautama declare existence is not eternal, this is the truth, Thus, all other views are absolutely wrong. You responded by saying, You do not declare such a thing. Next, when asked, Does the good Sir Gautama declare existence is in fact limited and not boundless? This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. Again, you responded by saying, You do not declare such a thing. Next, when asked, does the good Sir Gautama declare existence is boundlessly eternal? This is the truth. Thus, all other views are absolutely wrong. You responded by saying, you do not declare such a thing. Next, when asked, 
does the good sir gautama declare the soul and the body are one and the same this is the truth while all others are absolutely wrong you responded by saying you do not declare such a thing next when asked does the good sir gautama declare the soul is separate and thus different from the physical body this is the truth and all others are absolutely wrong you responded by saying you do not declare such a thing next when asked does the good sir gautama declare the tathagata lives on after death this is the truth and all others are absolutely wrong you responded by saying you do not declare such a thing next when asked does the good sir gautama declare once dead the tathagata does not live after death this is the truth and all others are absolutely wrong you responded by saying you do not declare such a thing next when asked does the good sir gautama declare the tathagata both exists and does not exist after his death this is the truth all others are absolutely wrong you responded by saying you do not declare such a thing and when asked does the good sir gautama declare the tathagata neither exists nor does he not exist after his death this is the truth all others are absolutely wrong you responded by saying you do not declare such a thing in that case i have to admit that i am unclear as to what it is that the good sir gautama teaches and declares and the blessed one replied Uttiya, i teach and declare the dhamma after having personally realized it directly and by myself it is this dhamma that i teach and instruct to my disciples for the purification of beings for the ending of sorrow lamentation pain depression and anguish i declare this dhamma so that they too can achieve success in this method and thus personally attain nibbana supreme in that case when the good sir gautama teaches and declares the dhamma after having personally realized it directly and by himself the dhamma that he teaches and instructs to his disciples for the purification of beings for the ending of sorrow lamentation pain depression and anguish declaring this dhamma so that they too can achieve success in this method and thus personally attain nibbana supreme now would you say that by declaring this dhamma the whole existence or half of existence or maybe a third of existence comes to attain liberation now when this was asked the blessed one kept silent then it occurred to the venerable ananda this wandering ascetic uttiya has been asking his questions while overcome by wrong view and now he asks this question which does not deserve a response from the blessed one furthermore he does not seem to be getting the point as to why the blessed one is silent to his last question and chances are while being guided by his wrong and evil views if he does not get some form of a reply he most probably will misunderstand and misconstrue the blessed one's silence by thinking to himself that ah the recluse Gautama is now flustered with my question, unable to reply, hence his inability to provide a satisfying answer to my question. And this itself will certainly lead Uttiya, the wandering ascetic, to face tremendous harm and suffering, and for many years to come. So, the Venerable Ananda addressed Uttiya, the wandering ascetic, by saying, friend uttiya i will give you a simile because it often is the case that certain intelligent beings do understand the depth of what is being discussed through the medium of similes and metaphors imagine friend uttiya that there was a king 
who had a castle on the border of his kingdom a mighty frontier city with many fortifications like ramparts high walls and arches all connected through a single gate now there is a gatekeeper placed there who is intelligent alert experienced and very cautious keeping all strangers out only permitting those who are friendly to enter now as the gatekeeper carefully monitors and patrols the path that leads all around the fortress he does not observe there being even a tiny hole or crack in the thick walls that would be big enough to allow even a cat to slip through also this gatekeeper is not concerned as to how many occupants the city would have living within its walls and similarly he is not concerned as to how many people enter and leave the city gate however he does know one thing for certain that whoever enters or leaves the fortified city will do so by passing through that very same gate thus he reflects whatever decent-sized living beings wanting to enter or leave this city they will all have to do so by going through this gate and this very gate only in the same manner friend uttia the tathagata is not concerned whether the whole of existence or half of existence or maybe a third of existence comes to attain liberation however the tathagata does know for certain that those who are indeed released and thus liberated from this world whether in the past in the present or will be in the future they all have given up and left the five hindrances behind those obstructions that keep the heart corrupted and thus obscure and weaken the heart dwindling wisdom this they successfully accomplish by having anchored themselves through the four bases of mindfulness practice and further they would have developed in their maturity in the seven factors of awakening as they are truly supposed to be it is in this manner uttia that they are liberated from the world whether in the past in the present or in the future therefore friend uttia your question was not properly worded in your address to the blessed one hence it did not deserve a response from him especially seeing that you were continuing to ask the same question you had already asked for which the blessed one had already answered Kokanuda sutta the wandering ascetic Kokanuda. at one time the venerable ananda was staying at the tapoda hot springs monastery in rajagha when one early morning after having woken up he decided to go to the hot springs to wash after having bathed and come out of the water he stood there in his lower robe as he began drying himself it was then that the wandering ascetic kokanuda also decided to go to the hot springs to bathe at the crack of dawn on seeing the venerable ananda coming from the distance kokanuda the wandering ascetic exclaimed who is there friend a bhikkhu friend and which sect of bhikkhus do you belong to friend i am a bhikkhu from the sect of the sakyan son friend in that case i would like to ask the venerable one this question on a certain matter if the venerable would consider answering it please well you may go ahead and ask your question friend it is only after i heard it would i be able to know whether it is a question that i could answer or not is this your view friend existence is eternal this is the truth thus all other views are absolutely wrong no friend that is not my view 
Is this then your view, friend? Existence is not eternal. This is the truth. Thus, all other views are absolutely wrong. No, friend, that is not my view. Well, then, is this your view, friend? Existence is in fact limited and not boundless. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong? No, friend, that is not my view. In that case, is this your view, friend? Existence is boundlessly eternal. This is the truth. Thus, all other views are absolutely wrong. No, friend, that is not my view. How about this view, then, friend? The soul and the body are one and the same. This is the truth, while all others are absolutely wrong. No, friend, that is not my view. Is this, then, your view, friend? The soul is separate, and thus different from the physical body. This is the truth and all others are absolutely wrong. No, friend, that is not my view. Is this then your view, friend? The Tathagata lives on after death. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. No, friend, that is not my view. Well then, is this your view, friend? Once dead, the Tathagata does not live after death. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong? No, friend, that is not my view. In that case, is this your view, friend? The Tathagata both exists and does not exist after his death. This is the truth, all others are absolutely wrong? No, friend, that is not my view either. Would you then say that this is your view, friend? The Tathagata neither exists nor does he not exist after his death. This is the truth. All others are absolutely wrong. No, friend, that is not my view. Then would it not be fair to say that this venerable one does not know nor does he see? On the contrary, friend, I do know and I certainly do see. But, good sir, if that is so, then how is it that when asked whether you share the view existence is eternal, this is the truth, thus all other views are absolutely wrong, you responded by saying, you do not declare such a thing. Similarly, when asked whether you share the view existence is not eternal, this is the truth, thus all other views are absolutely wrong, you responded by saying, no, friend, that is not my view. Next, when asked whether you share the view existence is in fact limited and not boundless, this is the truth and all others are absolutely wrong, you responded by saying, no, friend, that is not my view. Next, when asked whether you share the view existence is boundlessly eternal, this is the truth, thus all other views are absolutely wrong, you responded by saying, No, friend, that is not my view. Next, when asked whether you share the view the soul and the body are one and the same, this is the truth, while all others are absolutely wrong, you responded by saying, No, friend, that is not my view. Next, when asked whether you share the view the soul is separate and thus different from the physical body, this is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong, you responded by saying, No, friend, that is not my view. Next, when asked whether you share the view the Tathagata lives on after death, this is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong, you responded by saying, No, friend, that is not my view. Next, when asked whether you share the view once dead, the Tathagata does not live after death. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. You responded by saying, No, friend, that is not my view. Next, when asked whether you share the view the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after his death, this is the truth, all others are absolutely wrong. You responded by saying, No, friend, that is not my view. And when asked whether you share the view the Tathagata neither exists nor does he not exist after his death, this is the truth, all others are absolutely wrong, 
you responded by saying, no, friend, that is not my view. Furthermore, friend, you claim that you do know, that you certainly do see. Therefore, could you please elaborate so I may understand what you mean? Friend, when one holds on to the view or declares existence is eternal, this is the truth. Thus, all other views are absolutely wrong. Despite their claim, such a declaration is simply no more than a false assumption, nothing more than pure speculation. And, when one holds on to the view or declares existence is not eternal, this is the truth, thus all other views are absolutely wrong, here too, despite one's claim, such a declaration is simply no more than a false assumption, nothing more than pure speculation. Also, when one holds on to the view or declares existence is in fact limited and not boundless, this is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. Here also, despite one's claim, such a declaration is simply no more than a false assumption, nothing more than pure speculation. And when one holds on to the view or declares existence is boundlessly eternal, this is the truth, thus all other views are absolutely wrong. Here also, despite one's claim, such a declaration is simply no more than a false assumption, nothing more than pure speculation. And when one holds on to the view or declares, the soul and the body are one and the same. This is the truth, while all others are absolutely wrong. Here also, despite one's claim, such a declaration is simply no more than a false assumption, nothing more than pure speculation. And when one holds on to the view or declares the soul is separate and thus different from the physical body, this is the truth and all others are absolutely wrong. Here also, despite one's claim, such a declaration is simply no more than a false assumption, nothing more than pure speculation. And when one holds on to the view or declares the Tathagata lives on after death, this is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. Here also, despite one's claim, such a declaration is simply no more than a false assumption, nothing more than pure speculation. And when one holds on to the view or declares, once dead, the Tathagata does not live after death. This is the truth, and all others are absolutely wrong. Here also, despite one's claim, such a declaration is simply no more than a false assumption, nothing more than pure speculation. And when one holds on to the view or declares the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after his death, this is the truth, all others are absolutely wrong. Here also, despite one's claim, such a declaration is simply no more than a false assumption, nothing more than pure speculation. And when one holds on to the view or declares the Tathagata neither exists nor does he not exist after his death, this is the truth, all others are absolutely wrong. Here also, yet again, despite one's claim, such a declaration is simply no more than a false assumption, nothing more than pure speculation. Friend, on witnessing the presence of such views, speculations and opinions. On witnessing the various gradations of such views, speculations and opinions. On witnessing those who hold on to dear life becoming attached to their views, speculations and opinions. And on witnessing the root cause for these obsessive attachment to views, and especially the very possibility for the uprooting of all these views, speculations and opinions. To that extent, friend, I can declare that I do know, and most certainly, I do see. And what might be the Venerable One's name? How is the Venerable One known and addressed by his fellow companions in the holy life? 
My name is Ananda, friend. What a great opportunity indeed it is for us. What great good fortune it is for us to run into such a great teacher as the Venerable Ananda. For if we did know, we would not have spoken so much and troubled the Venerable Ananda. May the Venerable One please forgive us. Ahunaya Sutta Worthy of Offerings and Respect Bhikkhus, when the bhikkhu possesses these ten qualities, he is truly worthy of gifts, being truly worthy of hospitality, deserving of offerings, and indeed merits the receiving of reverential salutation with both one's hands placed together at the heart. For he then becomes truly the unsurpassed field of merits for the entire existence. And what are these ten? Here, the bhikkhu is virtuous, living ethically, while restrained according to the discipline code of the Patimukha, conducting himself in right behavior, while seeing the danger in the slightest fault. Thus, he lives virtuously, while adhering to the code of discipline. Next, the bhikkhu is very learned, remembering and keeping what he has learned close in his heart, studying and reflecting on the Dhamma that is beautiful in its beginning, beautiful in its middle, and beautiful in its end. He does this while opening himself to its full and correct meaning and phrasing, whereby the teachings become clearly revealed to him. Thus, he witnesses directly how the holy life is utterly perfect and pure, which he ponders deeply, studies and remembers it, recites it, and through reciting he penetrates it with vision. Also, the bhikkhu has good friends and companions in the spiritual path, who inspire and encourage him to strive on the holy life. Also, because the bhikkhu possesses right view in his heart, his vision is accurate, always approaching with the correct perspective. Next, the bhikkhu wields various psychic powers, whereby he is able to accomplish whatever he wills, for example, determining, while being a single individual, may I become many. And once having multiplied himself many times over, and thus become many, may I become one again, and he does so with ease. Later, he may will, may I appear and disappear as I please, and he does so with ease. May I move unobstructed through walls, embankments and rocks, as though passing through space, and he does so with ease. May I slip in and out of the earth beneath me, as if submerging into water, and he does so with ease. May I walk on water without disturbing its surface, as though it's solid ground, and he does so with ease. May I comfortably travel through the skies like a bird, and he does so with ease. May I touch the moon and the sun with my hand, and may I wield these powers while in this body, as far as the Brahma world, and he does all this with ease. Next, the bhikkhu, possessing the divine ear element that is pure and refined, far superior to that of human beings, he is able to hear sounds from both the heavenly realms as well as the human, be they far or near. Next, the bhikkhu is one who knows and penetrates into the hearts of other beings whereby he directly knows and understands the mental states of other beings, as well as people. Thus, he comes to know and recognize a heart overwhelmed with lust as a heart that is full of lust, and a heart without lust as a heart that does not possess lust. Similarly, he knows and recognizes a heart that is overwhelmed with hatred as a heart that is full of hate, 
and a heart without hatred as a heart that does not possess hate. Similarly, he knows and recognizes a heart overwhelmed with delusion as a heart that is full of delusion, and a heart without delusion as a heart that does not possess delusion. Similarly, he knows and recognizes a heart that is dull and overwhelmed with lethargy, as a heart that is full of lethargy and sloth, and a scattered heart as being scattered. Similarly, he knows and recognizes a fearlessly expansive heart as being fearlessly expansive, and a fearful and contracted heart as being fearful and contracted. Similarly, he knows and recognizes a mediocre heart as overwhelmed by mediocrity and an excellent heart as being excellent. Similarly, he knows and recognizes a heart that is collected into the stability of samadhi as being collected into the stability of samadhi and an uncollected heart as uncollected. Similarly, he knows and recognizes a released heart as a released heart, and a yet-to-be-released heart as yet-to-be-released. Next, the bhikkhu is one who recollects the manifold past lives he has lived. Thus, he is able to remember his many past lives in all their details and features. That is, one birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, ten births, twenty births, thirty, forty, fifty births, a hundred births, a thousand births, a hundred thousand births, many eons of world expansions, many eons of world contractions, many eons of world expansions and contractions, recalling them all in this manner. There I was so named of such a family, with such an appearance. Such was my food and sustenance. Such were my experiences of pleasure and pain. Such was my lifespan. And after passing away from there, I was reborn elsewhere. And there too I was so named of such a family, with such an appearance. Such was my food and sustenance. Such were my experiences of pleasure and pain. And such was my lifespan. And passing away from there, I was reborn here. In this manner, the bhikkhu recalls his numerous past lives and where he has lived with their specific details and features. Next, the bhikkhu is one who possesses the divine eye, which is pure and far superior compared to those of humans and other beings as he applies the psychic power of knowing the destinations of beings, as they die and reappear into the different realms of existence. Thus he sees clearly all types of beings dying at the end of life, whether being reborn into exalted or miserable states, beautiful or ugly, fortunate or unfortunate, witnessing this by directly seeing, and therefore understanding clearly how beings pass on to different states according to their actions, whereby he knows how these beings who behaved badly through their bodily actions, their speech, and their mental actions, being disrespectful towards the noble ones, while grasping on to their wrong views, and on account of their wrong views in action, with the breakup of the body after death, are now reborn into a state of misery, utter deprivation, in a bad destination, in evil states, and in the hells. But these worthy beings who behaved virtuously through their bodily actions, their speech, and their mental actions, being respectful towards the noble ones, being right in their views, and, on account of their right views in action, with the breakup of the body, after death, are now reborn into a state of happiness, in a good destination, even in the heavenly world. Therefore, with the divine eye, which is far superior to those of human beings and other animals, the bhikkhu sees clearly beings dying at the end of their life, and how they are reborn into either exalted or miserable states, beautiful or ugly, fortunate or unfortunate, 
witnessing this by directly seeing, and therefore understanding clearly how beings pass on to different states according to their actions. But especially, the bhikkhu, by having destroyed the heart's contaminants, the asavas, he lives and experiences life right now with direct understanding and through his own personal and unshakable knowledge as he realizes the immaculate release of the heart as he experiences liberation through wisdom here in this very life therefore bhikkhus when the bhikkhu possesses these ten qualities he is truly worthy of gifts being truly worthy of hospitality deserving of offerings and indeed merits the receiving of reverential salutation with both one's hands placed together at the heart for he then becomes truly the unsurpassed field of merits for the entire existence Tera Sutta, the elder bhikkhu bhikkhus the bhikkhu who possesses these ten qualities Wherever he may go, in whatever unfamiliar region he may end up in, he will continue to be at ease. And what are these ten? He is an elder, a tera, who has gone forth and has been living the monastic life for many years. The bhikkhu is virtuous, living ethically while restrained according to the discipline code of the Patimokkha conducting himself in right behavior, while seeing the danger in the slightest fault. Thus he lives virtuously, while adhering to the code of discipline. Next, the bhikkhu is very learned, remembering and keeping what he has learned close in his heart, studying and reflecting on the dhamma that is beautiful in its beginning, beautiful in its middle, and beautiful in its end. He does this while opening himself to its full and correct meaning and phrasing, whereby the teachings become clearly revealed to him. Thus he witnesses directly how the holy life is utterly perfect and pure, which he ponders deeply, studies and remembers it, recites it, and through reciting he penetrates it with vision. The bhikkhu is properly trained and taught in both patimokkhas, Thus, he really knows them in detail, by having scrutinized and carefully determined their various aspects of application. While himself, he knows how each of these respective rules came about, their circumstances and purpose in being instituted by the Blessed One himself. Thus, he explains them, and the judgments to be made according to what is proper, and how these rules are to be followed. Next, the bhikkhu is skilled at identifying the circumstances that may lead to incidents that become disciplinary issues, and as such he knows and understands as to what may constitute a disciplinary issue, and furthermore he knows how to settle them. Next, he truly loves and appreciates the Dhamma who, having penetrated into its deeper aspects, has now come to delight in living and discussing it in its highest form. He delights in discussing the highest form of its training. Next, the bhikkhu is content with whatever robes he may be provided with, the same with the alms food that he receives, the lodging, and the medical attention and requisites he obtains whenever he becomes ill. Next, the bhikkhu is graceful while coming and going, kind and approachable and welcoming. He is appreciative and considerate in his demeanor, and when invited somewhere or into a dwelling place, he has proper decorum in his mannerisms, including in the way he sits down, for he is restrained in his behavior and mindful of the position of his body and limbs, remaining fully aware throughout. Next, the bhikkhu, whenever he desires to, he attains to the four jhanas without much difficulty and with ease, 
the jhanas that are lovely resting stations for the mind which he has access to and gets to enjoy right here and now next the bhikkhu by having destroyed the heart's contaminants the asavas he lives and experiences life right now with direct understanding and through his own personal and unshakable knowledge as he realizes the immaculate release of the heart and experiences liberation through wisdom here in this very life thus bhikkhus the bhikkhu who possesses these ten qualities wherever he may go and whatever unfamiliar region he may end up in he will continue to be at ease upali sutta the venerable upali once the venerable upali approached the blessed one and after paying his respects sat to one side and said bante i wish to go into the remote areas of the jungle and spend more of my time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest upali living in remote areas of the jungle or spending time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest is difficult to bear it is difficult to truly come to appreciate or delight in the seclusion those places might provide such seclusion strikes at the heart of the bhikkhu while stealing it away whenever his heart and mind are not in samadhi it is for this reason upali that anyone struggling to attain deep levels of samadhi but who says i am going to the remote areas of the jungle and spend more of my time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest so to gain samadhi must instead reconsider otherwise as a result what is to be expected for him is that whatever mental equipoise and calm he might currently possess that too will be gone because he will simply drown in thoughts having to do with sensuality or be blown away with agitating feelings imagine upali a mature bull elephant of about two and a half to three and a half meters tall who approaches a large pond full with water and he has the thought what if i enter this lovely pond as i begin washing my ears and back while enjoying a lovely bath and drink my fill and then whenever i feel like it only then come out and dry myself under the sun so the large bull elephant enters the pond and begins washing his ears and back while enjoying a bath and drinks to his satisfaction and then whenever he felt he had enough only then come out and dry himself under the sun and why is that it is because upali that bull elephant has a giant stature and therefore could withstand the depth of water he swims in always maintaining close contact with the bottom of the pond thus he enjoys himself totally unconcerned and in safety but then upali imagine a rabbit or a cat might come by and it also looking at the size of the pond has the thought what if i enter this lovely pond as i begin washing my ears and back while enjoying a lovely bath and drink my fill and then whenever i feel like it only then come out and dry myself under the sun so the rabbit or the cat enters the pond but without having carefully considered the matter enough because soon enough the rabbit or cat will very quickly realize that it cannot find any footing and begins to struggle and as a consequence starts to drown or float away in the commotion created from the ensuing agitating panic and why is that it is because upali its body size and stature are quite small while the pond is too big as well as deep for its small height 
in just the same manner upali anyone struggling to attain deep levels of samadhi but who says i'm going to the remote areas of the jungle and spend more of my time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest so to gain samadhi must instead reconsider otherwise as a result what is to be expected for him is that whatever mental equipoise and calm he might currently possess that too will be gone because he will simply drown in thoughts having to do with sensuality or be blown away with agitating feelings upali imagine seeing a little baby boy who while lying on his back and for amusement he starts playing with his own urine and feces now would you not consider that type of amusement to be completely foolish oh yes bunte however upali after a few years once that boy grows up and begins developing his cognitive and emotional abilities more you would then witness him playing games that are typical for boys his age games such as playing with a toy plow stick throwing doing the somersaults running with or playing with a toy windmill toy measures playing with toy carts or small toy bows now would you not consider that type of amusement to be better than his previous pastime and enjoyment hence completely appropriate and healthy for a boy his age oh yes bunte and even some years after that upali once that boy had grown up into being a man with mature and developed cognitive and emotional faculties where you witness him enjoying himself while being endowed with the five strands of sense pleasures thus you see him being delighted while experiencing lovely visible forms that are caught by the awareness of the eyes and that are enjoyed for causing one pleasure for being delightfully enticing which provoke lust to arise in the heart he delights in experiencing lovely sounds that are caught by the awareness of the ears that are enjoyed for causing one pleasure for being delightfully enticing which provoke lust to arise in the heart he delights in experiencing lovely odors that are caught by the awareness of the nose that are enjoyed for causing one pleasure for being delightfully enticing which provoke lust to arise in the heart he delights in experiencing lovely flavors that are caught by the awareness of the tongue that are enjoyed for causing one pleasure for being delightfully enticing which provoke lust to arise in the heart he delights in experiencing lovely touches that are caught by the awareness of the body that are enjoyed for causing one pleasure for being delightfully enticing which provoke lust to arise in the heart now would you not consider that type of amusement to be better than the previous upali hence completely appropriate for an average man of his age oh yes bante here now upali the tathagata arises in the world an arahant perfectly awakened endowed with true knowledge and conduct the fortunate one knower of the worlds the incomparable tamer of those to be tamed the teacher of both gods and humans the awakened one and blessed he declares the dhamma which he himself has personally known and realized to the world together with its devas humans mara brahma and the community of recluses and brahmins he teaches the dhamma that is lovely in its beginning lovely in the middle and lovely in its end with full of meaning and perfectly balanced in its expression and phrasing while declaring and revealing the completeness and purity of the holy life a householder or the son of a householder born to a certain family hears that dhamma and gains faith in it and in the tathagata then the householder reflects to himself household life is troublesome and problematic it is full of impurities whereas going forth into homelessness is wide open with many possibilities 
It is not easy to lead the holy life that is complete and pure to its fullness while living the household life. What if I shave my head and beard and put on the monastic robes and just go forth? So, in due course, he gives up a small or a large amount of wealth giving up a small circle or a large circle of friends and relatives, as he shaves his head and beard and puts on the monastic robes and goes forth into homelessness. Having gone forth thus, he trains himself in the monastic precepts, while abandoning the destruction of living beings as he gives up the tendency to harm, throwing away of his weapons, Caring and considerate with aroused compassion, he abides with compassion for all living beings, by giving up, taking what is not freely given to him. He only accepts what is given. By giving up the common and unholy life, he leads a holy life of chastity, while abstaining from the low practice of sexual intercourse. By giving up of telling lies, he speaks only what is truth and becomes trustworthy in the world. By giving up slandering, he does not go and tell over there what he has heard here in order to create a schism between people. Similarly, he does not tell here what he had heard over there in order to create a schism between people. Thus, he speaks in order to join the disjointed and separated, while strengthening the wholesome bonds between people. Fond of unity, he talks words that lead to unity. By giving up rough words, he speaks politely and with a pleasant, sweet voice, with words that go straight to the heart. His words are accepted by all the masses. By giving up frivolous speech and idle chatter, he speaks at the right time speaking only what is truth and meaningful. He speaks only the Dhamma and the discipline, and at the right time, using appropriate words and succinctly, such words that are worth being recorded and repeated due to their beneficial nature. He refrains from destroying seeds, fruit trees, and vegetable plants, while refraining from taking food at night time, he only takes one meal a day. He refrains from dancing, music, and musical entertainments. He refrains from decorating himself with flowers, scents, or fragrant ointments. He gives up high and stately beds. He refrains from accepting gold, silver, and money. He does not accept raw grains, raw flesh, women, girls, slaves, whether women or men goats and sheep, roosters and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses, or mares. He does not accept fields or lands. He abstains from carrying messages between people, from buying and selling, or in dealing in matters unfairly, such as measures and weights. He does not take bribes, nor cheat or do any insincere acts. He does not cut, kill, or bind and he does not collect even a single morsel of food violently and in voracious, barbaric ways. Being fully contented and satisfied with the robes for the body and morsels of food for the stomach, wherever he goes, he goes with all his things, like a bird that flies freely with only the feathers on its back. In the same way, the bhikkhu, contented and satisfied with the robes for the body and morsels of food for the stomach. Wherever he goes, he goes with all his things. By possessing these virtues of the noble ones, the bhikkhu experiences the internal happiness and appeasement that is blameless. On seeing a form with the eye, he does not allow himself to be taken by or absorbed into its features and details, for he knows quite well that if he were to abide with an otherwise uncontrolled eye faculty, unwholesome states would start to leak in, whereby he may very well fall victim to longing 
covetousness and dejection that would dominate his thoughts. Thus, he guards and practices restraint of the eye faculty. Similarly, the bhikkhu, on hearing a sound, he does not allow himself to be taken by or absorbed into its features and details, for he knows quite well that if he were to abide within an otherwise uncontrolled ear faculty, unwholesome states would start to leak in, whereby he may very well fall victim to longing, covetousness, and dejection that would dominate his thoughts. Thus he guards and practices restraint of the ear faculty. Similarly, the bhikkhu, on smelling an odor, does not allow himself to be taken by or absorbed into its features and details, for he knows quite well that if he were to abide with an otherwise uncontrolled nose faculty, unwholesome states would start to leak in, whereby he may very well fall victim to longing, covetousness, and dejection that would dominate his thoughts. Thus he guards and practices restraint of the nose faculty. Similarly, the bhikkhu on tasting a flavor, he does not allow himself to be taken by or absorbed into its features and details, for he knows quite well that if he were to abide with an otherwise uncontrolled tongue faculty, unwholesome states would start to leak in whereby he may very well fall victim to longing, covetousness, and dejection that would dominate his thoughts. Thus he guards and practices restraint of the tongue faculty. Similarly, the bhikkhu on touching a tactile object, he does not allow himself to be taken by or absorbed into its features and details, for he knows quite well that if he were to abide with an otherwise uncontrolled body faculty, unwholesome states would start to leak in, whereby he may very well fall victim to longing, covetousness, and dejection that would dominate his thoughts. Thus he guards and practices restraint of the body faculty. Similarly, the bhikkhu on knowing a thought he does not allow himself to be taken by or absorbed into its features and details, for he knows quite well that if he were to abide with an otherwise uncontrolled mind faculty, unwholesome states would start to leak in, whereby he may very well fall victim to longing, covetousness, and dejection that would dominate his thoughts. Thus he guards and practices restraint of the mind faculty. Possessing complete restraint over his mental faculties, such a bhikkhu is not perturbed when touched by a displeasing negative experience. Whether approaching and going away, in looking forward, backward and about, he remains mindful, clearly comprehending its experience. Also, when bending and stretching his limbs, or in wearing his outer robes or taking the bowl with him, he remains mindful, clearly comprehending its experience. When eating his meal, drinking and tasting, he remains mindful, moving and behaving with full awareness, clearly comprehending the entire experience. Similarly, when urinating and defecating, he remains mindful, moving and behaving with full awareness, clearly comprehending the entire experience, whether he is walking, standing, sitting, or lying down to rest, or while waking up, speaking, or while being silent. Now being endowed with this virtuous behavior of the noble ones, the complete restraint over his mental faculties, along with mindfulness and clear comprehension, distinctive of the noble ones, he looks for and abides in a secluded dwelling, a forest, the root of a tree, a mountain grotto, a cemetery, a forest or a jungle, an open space or a heap of straw. Then, by having found himself a quiet area to practice in the forest or by the visible roots of the trees or in an empty room, by folding his legs in a comfortable position, and keeping the body straight, he establishes mindfulness in front of him. 
he thus trains and lives by actively dropping lust and greed from his heart as he purifies it from the stains of coveting he trains and lives by actively dropping anger from his heart as he purifies it from the stains of hatred he trains and lives by actively dropping delusion from his heart as he purifies it from the stains of delusion he develops compassion towards all living beings as he purifies his heart of any hatred or ill will with mindfulness and clearly comprehending his experience he actively pushes through both drowsiness and procrastination as he abides with the perception of light cleansing his mind from drowsiness and procrastination he thus calmly stabilizes the agitated heart while carefully moving beyond both restlessness and worry as he abides with a heart that is now internally appeased and contented finally by actively removing doubt he abides while putting an end to all doubts about the wholesome behaviors that should be developed and the unwholesome behaviors that should be abandoned now by overcoming these obstructive five hindrances the bhikkhu while being secluded from sensual and unwholesome thoughts enters upon and abides in the first jhana which is accompanied by thinking and pondering with joy and pleasure that arise from such a seclusion now upali would you not consider that type of activity and engagement of oneself in life better therefore far more superior and excellent than any of the ones preceding it oh yes indeed bante now upali it is when any of my disciples know for themselves that they are already quite well acclimated and dwell while being firmly established in these excellent states of mind that they then go into the remote areas of the jungle and spend more of their time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest to further their practice however it must also be said that thus far they still have not yet attained to the goal of the holy life later through the disappearance of both thinking and pondering the bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the second jhana which has self-confidence and singleness of mind, this time in the absence of both thinking and pondering, but with experiencing of joy and pleasure that arise from their samadhi, the stable collectedness of the heart. Now, Upali, would you not consider this type of activity and engagement of oneself in life better, therefore far more superior and excellent than the ones preceding it? oh yes indeed bante now upali it is when any of my disciples know for themselves that they are already quite well acclimated and dwell while being firmly established in this excellent state of mind that they then go into the remote areas of the jungle and spend more of their time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest to further their practice however it must also be said that thus far they still have not yet attained to the goal of the holy life further upali with the detachment from joy the bhikkhu later abides in equanimity mindful and fully aware experiencing pleasure and happiness within the body this is the third jhana for which the noble ones state how such a person mindfully abides in happiness with an ever-present sense of equanimity. Now, Upali, would you not consider this type of activity and engagement of oneself in life better, therefore far more superior and excellent than the ones preceding it? Oh, yes, indeed, Bante. Now, Upali, it is when any of my disciples know for themselves that they are already quite well acclimated and dwell while being firmly established in this excellent state of mind that they then go into the remote areas of the jungle 
and spend more of their time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest to further their practice. However, it must also be said that thus far they still have not yet attained to the goal of the holy life. Afterwards, Upali, by giving up both pleasure and pain, and having already gone beyond joy and anguish, the bhikkhu remains in a state of purifying mindfulness with the ever-growing sense of equanimity, while experiencing neither pleasure nor pain, having gone beyond both, as he attains to the fourth jhana. Now, Upali, would you not consider this type of activity an engagement of oneself in life better, therefore far more superior and excellent than the one preceding it? Oh, yes, indeed, Bhante. Now, Upali, it is when any of my disciples knows for themselves that they are already quite well acclimated and dwell while being firmly established in this excellent state of mind that they then go into the remote areas of the jungle and spend more of their time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest to further their practice. However, it must also be said that thus far they still have not yet attained to the goal of the holy life, Next, Upali, by having completely transcended and gone beyond the confines of the physical world and of tangibility, along with the disappearance of perceptions dealing with sensory reflexive contact, and by no longer paying any attention to the multiplicity of unending perceptions, and instead, while remaining fully aware of how space is infinitely boundless, the bhikkhu enters and dwells in the dimension of boundless infinity of space. Now here too, Upali, would you not consider this type of activity and engagement of oneself in life better, therefore far more superior and excellent than the ones preceding it? Oh, yes, indeed, Bhante. Now, Upali, it is when any of my disciples know for themselves that they are already quite well acclimated and dwell while being firmly established in this excellent state of mind that they then go into the remote areas of the jungle and spend more of their time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest to further their practice however it must also be said that thus far they still have not yet attained to the goal of the holy life also, Upali, by having completely transcended the state of space being infinitely boundless, and by experiencing and being fully aware of how consciousness is boundlessly infinite, the bhikkhu enters and dwells in the dimension of boundless infinity of consciousness. Now here too, Upali, would you not consider this type of activity and engagement of oneself in life better, therefore far more superior and excellent than the one preceding it? Oh, yes, indeed, Bhante. Now, Upali, it is when any of my disciples knows for themselves that they are already quite well acclimated and dwell while being firmly established in this excellent state of mind that they then go into the remote areas of the jungle and spend more of their time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest to further their practice. However, it must also be said that thus far they still have not yet attained to the goal of the holy life. Again, Upali, by having completely transcended the state of consciousness being infinitely boundless, and while experiencing and remaining fully aware how there is nothing at all, the bhikkhu enters and dwells in the dimension of nothingness. Now this too, Upali, would you not consider this type of activity and engagement of oneself in life better, therefore far more superior and excellent than the ones preceding it? Oh, yes, indeed, Bhante. Now, Upali, it is when any of my disciples knows for themselves that they are already quite well acclimated and dwell while being firmly established in this excellent state of mind that they then go into 
the remote areas of the jungle and spend more of their time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest to further their practice. However, it must also be said that thus far they still have not yet attained to the goal of the holy life. Next Upali, the bhikkhu, then, by having transcended the state of nothingness, while being aware how this is truly peaceful, this is truly exceptional, enters and dwells in the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. This too, Upali, would you not consider this type of activity and engagement of oneself in life better? therefore far more superior and excellent than the one preceding it oh yes indeed bante now upali it is when any of my disciples knows for themselves that they are already quite well acclimated and dwell while being firmly established in this excellent state of mind that they then go into the remote areas of the jungle and spend more of their time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest to further their practice. However, it must also be said that thus far they still have not yet attained to the goal of the holy life. Furthermore, Upali, by having completely gone beyond the state of neither perception nor non-perception, the bhikkhu enters and dwells in the cessation of perception and feeling. And when this occurs, Upali, the bhikkhu knows and understands it directly for himself, that, indeed, his asavas are all wiped out and are now fully worn away. Now this too, Upali, would you not consider this type of activity and engagement of oneself in life better, therefore far more superior and excellent than the one preceding it? Oh, yes, indeed, Bhante. Now Upali... It is when any of my disciples knows for themselves that they are already quite well acclimated and dwell while being firmly established in this excellent state of mind that they then go into the remote areas of the jungle and spend more of their time in the desolate and wilderness parts of the forest to further their practice. And at this point it is declared that they have indeed attained to the goal of the holy life. So, come, Upali, stay here within the protection of the Sangha, and you will remain at ease. Abhabha Sutta Incapable Bhikkhus so long as you have not dispelled and rid yourselves from these ten things, you will be incapable of realizing arahantship for yourselves. And what are these ten things? Lust, hatred, delusion, anger, vengefulness, contempt, maliciousness, envy, stinginess, and conceit. Therefore, without dispelling and ridding yourselves from these ten things, you will be incapable to realize arahanship for yourselves. However, bhikkhus, by having dispelled and rid yourselves from these ten things, you will be capable of realizing arahanship for yourselves. And what are these ten things? Lust, hatred, delusion, anger, vengefulness, contempt, maliciousness, envy, stinginess, and conceit. Therefore, Having dispelled and rid yourselves from these ten things, you will be capable of realizing arahantship for yourselves. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.